It's kind of like walking into a forest. You could go in 20 steps and close your eyes and then, you know, get spun in a circle and you open your eyes and all you see is trees around you. I have older brothers and they uh, were very in the beginning stages of their addiction. So that's when I first was really exposed to any kind of alcohol, drugs, anything like that. And the first time I got drunk, I got blackout drunk and I was off and running. In 2014, April, I was working in a hospital and I was escorted off the floor and taken down for uh, testing. I was asked not to come back to work. They sent me to treatment and that still, that just wasn't enough. I ran until August. Just, I, I, I didn't draw a sober breath. I was lying on a bathroom floor, vomiting blood. I, I was virtually dying, bleeding out. I didn't go to detox because I wanted to get sober. I went to detox because I was so sick I couldn't hold the alcohol down. And that was the only thing that was going to get me better. It was 15 years of absolute destruction hurting people, hurting myself, doing everything and anything to get drunk at any cost. Growing up, um, alcohol was always something that I went to. I've been drinking since I was 13, um, alcoholically, I'll say, you know, just waiting for the weekends um, so I could get drunk and you know, party. I traded my alcoholism for heroin. It took me to my knees and it was all I wanted. It's all I did for about a year and a half and, and it was insanity. It took me down roads that I never knew were possible. I was mixing drugs, um, methamphetamines. I shot it into my hand. My entire hand pretty much was unfunctional. It was front and back. It brought me to a place where I'm like, I'm literally losing myself to this because I'm, I'm a dental assistant outside of everything. Um, and my hands are what I work with. And it killed me because I worked so hard to get my degree, to go to college and, you know, become something. You know, you see what everybody else is doing. It was a social thing to start and, you know, somewhere it went south on me. My focus was, you know, a new love, so to speak. I went down a path that was pretty dark um, during that whole time frame and, you know, started involving other substances other than alcohol where I could still function through life um, and didn't even know what was happening around me. I would be driving home and like crying because everything inside of me wanted to go home to be with my family. But everything inside of me also knew that that was not going to happen. I was so caught up in this world of, you know, alcohol and drugs that it was pulling me away from everything that I could care about. So I ended up, you know, having multiple incidents with the law and things like that and finally found somebody that held me accountable for my behavior. I ended up getting into a program of recovery where I met, you know, the people that were going to lead me out of the forest and, you know, led me back to understanding that there's a life outside of all that. Prior to getting sober, I had worked in healthcare for 15 years. And I knew I wanted to work with people again. I was sitting at my mom's house one day and her next door neighbor is on the board of directors for The Road to Hope. And I said, hey, if you know anybody hiring, and he was like, give me your resume, like we'll get you in at The Road to Hope. They say intensive work with another alcoholic will ensure our recovery. And Road to Hope's given me that opportunity, you know, 24 seven some weeks. I had a sponsor in 
the program of recovery that like showed me love like I didn't understand for these individuals to care about me the way they did it like drew so much interest to me I started taking people into my home just one person at a time you know help them get sobered up when I founded the Road to Hope it was like the idea of just being able to help other people I'm an alcoholic and an addict, recovered addict. Like, I have this need for more, so to speak. So, like, when I seen that happening and I felt great to see that and it gave me that same feeling of, like, back then where, like, we I used substances because it gives you an effect. And so helping people gave me an effect. I met my sponsor. She was very close with Aubrey. Her and Aubrey had worked together before. When she found out that I was there on my own, I wasn't court ordered or anything like that. I was just kind of doing it, you know, to better my life. She's like, well, how would you feel about just going to a different facility? I applied on a Thursday and my sponsor literally took me to Margo that Friday and I never looked back. They're all about helping you. They don't coddle you. They make you realize that this is life and death and like we came to these places to change. So, you know, they hold you accountable and, and they push you to work a program and get involved in the sober community. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for it. We're a certified recovery housing program, um, actually one of the largest in the state of Ohio. The importance with uh, being in recovery support services, it's strengthening relapse prevention. It's strengthening your personal recovery. It's giving you a network that, you know, you have to keep you held up. I'm able to empathize with them because I can genuinely look them in the eyes and say, I know what you're feeling. I've been here. Like, there is hope. You are worth this. Having the experience is what makes this work. Every single one of our employees is in recovery, whether they work in the office, whether it's the biggest executive, you know, the volunteer house managers. We're not walking before and we're walking with them in this. One of the greatest assets we have in trying to get help is being able to have support and, and being able to be part of a community. And the pandemic has removed that from us. We locked down for 11 weeks. We didn't take in residents for three months. And that was the hardest part, taking phone calls and not being able to help these women and men reaching out for help, telling someone's mother, like we're not taking people in right now, that that was horrific. When the unemployment and, and the PUA hit, you know, it did. It sent a lot of girls back out. Um, it was a lot of money for newly sober women and men, I'm sure. When they went back out and the, the lockdown happened, a lot of, you know, the opiates, the drugs and stuff, like, they, they weren't what they thought they were getting. It was mainly the fentanyl. So, like, we did. We experienced a lot of deaths um, of people that we knew. COVID affected people struggling with substance abuse in various ways. There's people out there that were two months sober when this happened on their own or whatever their circumstances are and meetings just shut down. As a person in recovery, not only with the Road to Hope, but in a recovery housing environment as a whole, like it was a better spot to be during everything going on than out there. Our residents were able to have meetings with other alcoholics every single day that they lived with. 
You know, they had people to turn to, like they, they weren't alone. When the lockdown happened, it, it was kind of a surprise. Like I didn't really know what was going on. <laughs> like we really didn't. I got asked to be house manager at Margo. In the 12 step program that I work, um, the 12 steps is, you know, helping another alcoholic um, and passing on like what I've learned. So when I was asked to do that, I, I looked in at a perspective of being able to help these women and being their guiding light in the way. God wants me to be happy, joyous, and free. Um, and, I, and I just have to remember to keep the faith and honestly, it's, it's his will, not mine. Are we making the right choice? Nobody knows what the right choice is. Nobody knows necessarily what the perfect choice or decision is in any situation with this. So we're making the best choice we can in what we think is gonna help the Road to Hope be successful, the residents be successful, and all of them be safe.